Church, we continue to talk about the gospel according to Matthew chapter 22. We're talking about this particular chapter because it's the beginning of Jesus teaching Jesus' disciples on the kingdom of God and what does it look like. They were all expecting a kingdom full of walls and weapons and soldiers to protect them against their enemy. And God, Jesus, was simply about to show them something different. In Matthew 22, verse 2, Jesus says the kingdom, is God, uh, the kingdom of God can be illustrated like a king who invited people to his son's wedding. A king that didn't make people do anything, but inviting them in relationship, in love. So I say the kingdom of God is like a child who is seen for the first time one of those blow-up castles that are coming in your yard. Recently, we purchased one for... Dante and Nico, and Dante has seen them, so he, he knew what to expect. But Nico, a year and a half, he had never seen anything like it. And his eyes just grew larger than life. Just imagine this baby boy seeing something so colorful. No kidding, this is what he did. Oh, 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 oh. The kingdom of God is like that, just like that. Something ready for us. Something to produce so much excitement and love. I remember Dante saying, oh, I cannot wait for all my friends to come and play. The kingdom of God is like a king who understands what it's like to be a child and welcome all his friends into a wonderful celebration. This month, we have been reinforcing the idea that in this life, you can lead in two ways. You can lead from the law that gives you authority, or you can lead from love, which gives you relationship. My parents many times try to lead me by the authority that they have as a father. But so much teachers who were in relationship with me had bigger influence in my life. I have learned that as an associate pastor, when I was in New York, I had more influence in the congregation than I am now as the head of staff. Why? Because the more you increase in authority, the less you depend in relationship. If we want to be faithful Christians, we need to grow in relationship rather than using authority. But ultimately, Jesus could have used his strength, his power, his mercy, his love to make us do what he wanted us to do. But instead, he put up with us, just like he put up with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and said, I want to be in relationship with you. I want to influence you through my love and relationship. As I was thinking about this last part of chapter 22, for whatever reason, I started thinking about Peter in the time of Jesus' arrest. A disciple of Christ carrying a sword to defend someone that didn't want to be defended. Why would the disciple Peter have a sword? Didn't he know what kind of leader Jesus was? Why would you have a sword? Why would you have a weapon? Now, mind you, I'm not talking about... There's about 17 of you in our congregation that sometimes comes and they have concealed weapons. No. There is something far more dangerous than a weapon. The evil in our hearts. 
weapons in our hearts, the things that we use that belong to us that could be used against someone else, something that cuts deeper than a bullet. There is something like that. So today we're talking about how to put our swords down, how to put or repurpose our weapons down. Let us begin with this. On verses 34 and 35, you will see that they met together to question Jesus again. The scriptures talks about the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are two groups that they don't like each other, but they both despite Jesus. So they come together and they want to check what can they do. One of them was an expert in religious law. Let me show it to you in a different way, though. They met together to check their weapons. What kind of things can we use against Jesus' love? That's what they were doing. They wanted to check their back of tricks. What is the most difficult question for us to get Jesus? One of them, an expert in religious law. That is the law of Moses. The 600 and some laws that Jews had to follow. But none of them were considering the law of God. Let me show you the difference. Before talking about the law of God, we must talk about the law of Moses. Do you know your weapons? Do you know what abilities do you have that could be used for good, but you choose sometimes to do for bad? Yesterday, I was playing softball in one of our tournaments in Lakeland. And whether you know this or not, I can run my mouth like the best out there. I have my helmet. I am pitching. But this does not come close. I just yap, 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 yap. Imagine a pitcher but a catcher talking at the same time. And I get annoying, increasingly annoying as a technique for me to get them off their game, for them to be concentrated in talking back to me rather than swinging their bat, or get them looking. I will say things like, hey, this is a ball, don't swing. This is a bad pitch. And I will toss the ball, obviously, in a strike. Believe me, it works. I know the power of my voice. I know the power of my convincing and how many times I have used it for the wrong thing. I have the ability of mockery. Because I can mock myself, then you pretty much cannot say anything against me. I make fun of myself. And if I make fun of myself, then you have nothing against me, really. But you, oh, that's a different thing. I have known when I was growing up in class, I would start taking things like this. This will be a good friend, and I'll start doing this. Just tapping their shoulder. And if you do this for 30 seconds, it's not a big deal. But you do this for 10, 15, 20, the whole day, you will see how annoying it gets. And the more the person gets annoying, the better I become. And I just tap slower. It's, it's, I don't know why I have that ability to mock. I recognize this. This is an evil that lives in me. I know. And sometimes I have used it for fun. Sometimes I've used it against someone. And I guarantee you that some of you have the same ability. Some of you have gifts and talents that were supposed to be given to you for something good. And you have sometimes turned them into something that it is not good. So many of you do this without even recognizing it. And some of you might say, well, no, 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 Mario. That's, I, I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. I never do anything against anybody. I don't use any. I'll say, stop right there. Look what Romans 7, especially verses 18 and 19 say. This is the Apostle Paul. And I know 
I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. This is the Apostle Paul saying these things. How much can you and I say? Sometimes we use those things, those gifts, those talents, those weapons that we were given to defend others, and we use them to attack others. We need to repent from that. Do you know your weapons? What gifts and talents do you have that serve an evil purpose? I think that we have to consider our gifts and talents and how we can employ them, how we can use them to serve a godly purpose. We need to put our gifts and talents for good reason. For example, the fact that I can mock myself is that I can put myself in situations where I will mock myself rather than mocking someone else, and I redirect their attention towards me. The reality is that you have a pastor that preaches on his second language, and I make many, many mistakes, and I don't care. However, if I can preach on my second language, that means that you can do it in your first language. If I am not afraid of speaking in English, despite my mistakes, that means that you have no excuse to preach the work of God using your first language. Do not be afraid, for you have a pastor that speaks and preaches with a broken English, and that will never stop me from preaching the truth of God. Amen? Amen. You have no excuse. You have gifts and talents that you need to bring to help your brothers and sisters. Because the reality is, my dear and beloved church, is that you have what your neighbor needs. Right now, you have. A neighbor is not the person that lives next door. Neighbor sometimes is your friend. Neighbor sometimes is a stranger. Neighbor sometimes is a person that lives three doors down. So let's talk about the law of God. Can we be experts in the law of God? Yes, we can. The question is, do you want to be an expert in the law of God? I hope that you say yes. Expert. Okay. Tell me more. All right. There's a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. He argues that to be an expert on something, it takes 10,000 hours of diligently, intentionally practice. That's about 10 years. Here's an example. Many of us have over 10 years of driving. Driving for over 10 years does not make you an expert in driving. It doesn't. What makes you an expert is 10,000 hours with diligently, intentionally getting better at it. And you get better at it by doing three things, Malcolm says. First one is that you need to set goals to achieve. The second one is that you need to get quick feedback so you can change if you're not being effective. The third one is that you need to run countless drills set to improve, coordinated by someone or something that has mastered the activity. What does this mean to us as Christians? This is what it means. You can pray and you can pray every day, but unless you set goals for your prayer and you get feedback from the Holy Spirit, and that you allow the master, Jesus, to tell you and improve you, then you are not an expert in prayer. We need to try. God's expectation is that we want to become experts in prayer, experts in reading the Bible, experts in preaching. That is why you are never to stop challenging yourself in growing this is why. 
Now, let's talk about the law of God. It's rather simple, really. You must intentionally practice to love God. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Equally important, you must love, intentionally love your neighbor. This means that if you don't know how to love God, you simply do it by loving your neighbor. How do you love your neighbor? Are you setting your goals? Are you setting feedback? Are you allowing the master Jesus to guide you? Now, there's a difference between an expert and a master. An expert is someone that is really good, really good, exceptionally good at something. But a master is something that changes the game forever. Talking again about baseball, because, you know, Pastor Mario loves baseball, and he sees God everywhere in baseball. Imagine that you are a pitcher, and that you know how to throw a two-seamer, a three-seamer, fast pitch. You know how to throw a knuckleball. You know how to throw a slider. Those are all great pitches. However, how about you create a whole different pitch? Something that looks wicked that nobody has seen. Something that will radically change the game. That will make you a master rather than an expert. Do we have only one master? Yes. His name is Jesus. And Jesus taught us to pray. There's nothing else that we need to practice. The master has given us all that we need to know. Again, it's rather simple. We only have one master, but we are challenged to become experts. How do, do we do this? By setting goals, by getting feedback, quick feedback, and running, running, running countless drills. So the good and the way that you love your neighbor becomes a reaction. Here's a story of a really good friend of mine. Let's say that this really good friend of mine is a plumber. And this plumber normally helps everyone around them with their plumber needs. One of those days, the neighbor who has requested the help of this plumber says, oh, I got a problem with one of the bathrooms. Can you come quickly? So, yes. Let me put this down, and I will come with the tools, and I'm going to go fix your toilet right away. Comes through the garage, and guess what happens? Oop, sorry, we lied. There is no toilet to fix. However, for the last 10 years, we have seen you cut your grass with a push mower. And you are so good to us and all our neighbors that we wanted to recognize you. It's not that you cannot longer use your push mower, but here... We have bought you a riding lawnmower so you can enjoy your weekends cutting your grass rather than pushing that old machine that you have. Now, let me ask you, is the gift really the riding lawnmower? Or is the gift is that your neighbor saw something that they could do to improve your quality of life and they did it with love? Because they deeply care for you. That, my friends, is something that provides a quick, a quick feedback. It's a goal setting and runs in countless drills. The good news about that is this. You can start doing this today. Consider not simply knowing the law, but grow in relationship with one another. Can you put into practice one thing today? Can you begin to love your neighbors as you love yourself? Can you do something so small and can you grow from it? I think you can. And God will encourage you. Let us pray.